And get your hair cut way up high Get yourself a lawyer, son You're gonna need a real good one Yes, indeed. It's that time of the week where David Whiting has walked into the studio to answer all your legal questions. Good morning. Good morning. One three hundred triple two seven seven four, or you can text oh four three seven 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 four seven seven four. But I said that really fast because we'd much rather that you call. I can't do follow ups on a text message. No, it's much. It's much more difficult. So, David, you had a little bit of homework. It wasn't a lot of homework, but it's something that I've never had to directly address. And uh, the caller last week was a gentleman by the name of David from Geelong West. Tree damage was the question. Uh, He has a shed in his backyard and the tree from the property next door is pushing the shed over. And it's now at the point where it's going to be an expensive fix. And the question is, who pays? And the analogy I gave was that somebody has a car accident and then there's another car accident on the same spot. The question is, in that scenario, the second uh, causer of the accident only pays the incremental amount. So that's David's problem. So all of the tree damage that was caused prior to the neighbour... But you, there's two problems here. The first one is is that the neighbour is responsible for any damage caused while the tree is in the neighbour's ownership. So if if the man next door lived there for 40 years, he's responsible for all of the damage to the tree. All the damage to the shed. All the damage to the shed mm. caused by the tree. If he moved there 18 months ago, um, if I own the shed, my difficulty is proving... Um, that it's that it's that the damage was caused in the last eighteen months, but now let's give you the other side of the problem, which makes this, which is why most of these just don't get litigated, is I bought a house with a damaged shed. Why is it the neighbour's responsibility to give me back a new shed? Or a fully repaired shed. So, if it existed at the time of the purchase, if the prob- it's like a pre-existing condition. Yes, yes. So that's the, there's the two problems. So you can see why people in David's situation are encouraged not to litigate. Mm. If they'd both been there for forty years, piece of cake, neighbour's problem. But you've then got these other issues with the fluction of time mm. and trying to prove that a tree has done damage in the last eighteen months. Tricky. Yes, very tricky. Uh, thank you for doing your homework. Such a good boy. (laughs) Peter in Williamstown. Hi, Peter. Peter, are you there? Yeah, hi. Hello. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Um, David, about 18 months ago, I booked a cruise through a travel agent and paid them the deposit and a few months later the full amount. Subsequently, the cruise was cancelled and now the cruise operator is in liquidation. Do I have a claim against the travel agent? Uh, it will depend upon what the deal is, Peter, but the normal proposition would be no, that the travel agent gets a uh, arranged the job for you but would have remitted the money to the cruise operator. So they're acting right. as your agent. Well, it's an interesting question. They're, they act both as your agent for the purpose of making the booking and they're the agent of the cruise operator for the purpose of receiving the money. Right. All right, so uh, there's kind of almost two parts. I would have said, yes, you should be able to... you certainly got a claim against the liquidator, but there'll be no money there. What I'd be looking at seeing is whether I want the travel agent to refund. Uh, any commission that was received would be some something that you might consider. But you also need to look at the terms of the agreement you have with the cruise operator. Because most of them will say something that if you don't, if the cruise is cancelled, you get a credit note, not a refund. Why didn't you pursue the refund? Uh, we did get a refund of the commission from the agent. They were good about that. Okay, it's fantastic. Uh, uh, yeah, the cruise operator kept cancelling cruises, uh, each one, until they finally went into liquidation. How long ago and, and, uh, did you pay? Or about eighteen months ago. Right. You and you would have. Did you pay with a credit card? No, unfortunately. Okay, because there might be a clawback available under the credit card schemes. I'm sorry, Peter. You're an unsecured creditor against the operator. 
Peter, I'm sorry about that too. Um, it's very difficult, isn't it, when you can't get a credit note because there is no business to give you a credit note, so oh, to speak. Oh, a credit note's only good if someone can honour the credit notes. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Craig in Kilsyth. Hi, Craig. Oh, hi, David. Um, um, I was just ringing up if I uh, could get a advice on a financial agreement. Fire away, Craig. Uh, it's going to thinking about getting married and everyone tells me I should probably get one. Get one? What, you're talking about a prenup? Yeah, pretty much, yes. Craig, I must say you sound out? remarkably like an existing client of mine. All right, anyway, uh, the answer would be yes, a prenuptial financial agreement, if executed properly and given effect to properly, is legally binding. Can I just simply give you uh, one word of advice? Uh, and that is that the agreement needs to be negotiated and executed at a time when no one's under pressure. So I've had a couple of requests from people to arrange for binding financial agreements four weeks out from the wedding, when the invitations have been set out, the venue has been hired, the church has mm. been arranged. And, and the clock's ticking. Uh, well, no, well, yep. Yeah, but there's a high court case that basically says... Now, how can you say that the agreement was freely and voluntarily entered into in circumstances where abandoning the wedding because you wouldn't sign a binding financial agreement would create, I would have thought, incredible angst and embarrassment to at least one of the parties? So, Craig, have you got plenty of time? Oh, he's only yeah. thinking about Maddie getting <laughs> married. So, so yes, yes. Should it, should so it's it kind of like, I, I'd like to marry you. Here's the ring and here are the conditions on which I'm giving it to you. Okay. Yep. Well, have the discussion, Craig. Yeah. Uh, yep. In plenty of time. Yes. Good luck, Craig. Uh, Natalie in Ballarat. Hello, Natalie. Hello. Um, I have a question regarding money paid um, to complete some, some work. My dad's a tradesman and he did some work for uh, a big company um, and put some of his own money in to buy materials. When the job was completed, the person who commissioned the work said we're no longer paying you oh wow how much is the debt over a hundred thousand wow money's owed. Um, why don't you uh there's a couple of have they explained why they're not paying they said that some of the work wasn't asked for um but the my dad did the work on good faith saying that there was mold that would have needed to be fixed and it was more oh, economical sorry. to do the work. But Natalie, Natalie, they yep. would have issued a purchase order. How much was the purchase order for? I'm not sure. No, well, um, we're not really talking about I don't owe you any money. It's just I don't owe you the money you're asking me to pay. Is that? Yes, yes. Okay, so you could... Um, it, it's probably... I think it's too much to be outside the VCAT's jurisdiction... But, but okay. let me have a look at that because otherwise you'd simply go to VCAT and say, um, I want to bring the proceeding here. So I'll give you the dollar limit or somebody might email us with the, uh, send us a text message as to the dollar limit of a civil claim at VCAT because okay. if you can bring it at VCAT, what you go to VCAT is for a declaration that they owe you that money or you owe oh, your dad that money. Lovely because for dad to go down a solicitor or barrister fee, uh, it's just too expensive for him. Yeah. Understood. Yep. All right. Um, anyone does know what those uh, civil well, limits it's are? It's a civil for limit for the for VCAT. Civil yes. limit for VCAT. If I was multi, if I was able to multitask, David, I'd look that up while I'm talking to okay, you. Okay. Well, then you'd be distracted. <laughs> exactly. One three hundred triple two seven seven four is the number. This doesn't happen very often, but there is a couple of lines fee free. There are a couple of lines free, I should say. So if you'd like some advice from David Whiting, give us a call. Uh, Frank in Fairfield. Hi, Frank. Oh, good morning. Um, I've got a bank account with a debit card that I use for day-to-day -day transactions, you know, groceries, petrol, uh, that sort of thing. And a couple of weeks ago, I noticed a foreign uh, currency transaction on the account that I couldn't identify. Yes. And I looked a bit more carefully at the online the statement online and found that there was actually quite a few of them. And uh, I called the uh, I called the bank. Yes. Uh, the most interesting thing was that they didn't seem at all surprised by this sort of thing. Well, I, look, they, I'm quite they, sure it happens a hell of a lot and we just don't talk about it. Uh, well, I like to talk about it because um, it's my money. But um, 
they said that they'd pass it on to their fraud department and the fraud department would look at it and get back to me in about six weeks. And so well, why don't you cancel the card and get a new one? I've done that. Okay, so but we're talking I'm, about the other transactions, yes? Uh, yeah, yeah. so there's a, a total of about 14 transactions with about uh, it's all fi- uh, about $500. They're all in relatively small amounts, all yes. less than 100 bucks. Yep. Uh, and what I want to know is, is the bank under any legal obligation to refund or to, to pay me back the money that's been stolen? Probably not, is the answer, Frank. They may choose to. Um, it's a question of looking at each of the transactions. How did the person who ordered the transaction get the details of the card? I have no idea. Well, that's the investigation that the bank's going to do. Most of the transactions that you see uh, occur in circumstances where the where someone has taken your card and has processed it in a particular way. I had, I've had, i had two overseas trips, uh, one to the United States of America where I got scammed and one to England where I got scammed. And we got a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning while in Europe saying, did you order something from John Lewis online? And the answer had to be, well, no, we didn't. I wasn't buying furniture in England at the time, <laughs> or ever for that matter. So, Frank, it's it's... And in both cases, someone got possession of our card other than in front of us, the second transaction, the English one, was at a hotel where they took the card and came back and the first one in the States was where they took the card as part of a uh, clothing purchase. So I don't think the card's ever been out of my possession. Well, then then the, let's see what the bank comes back with a fraud question. But as a general proposition, you're responsible for every transaction on your card. That's why we have to be careful. Frank, good luck with that. A couple of texts here, um, but... Uh, and I've just tried to Google it. VCAT, VCAT civil limit is 10,000, says one text. Another says 29,160 or less. So I don't know which one's right. right so, well, uh, can we call that homework for the time? Yeah, that's though? homework. Yes. Yep. And uh, I did try and quickly Google it, but it wasn't an easy answer. Um, and it do... depends on what the goods are. Yes. Uh, right, so okay. So that makes it... might be the magistrate's court, but we'll give Natalie a clearer answer next week. All right. And, uh, and I've got a text for Craig who was considering a prenup. If you think you need a prenup, says this texter, don't do it. <laughs> Is the answer. Uh, Sarah in Williamstown. Hello, Sarah. Oh, <clears throat> hello, David. Um, um, I'd just like some advice. Um, I've got to attend a pre-hearing conference regarding a fencing matter and um, the other party's um, uh, quite an unpleasant um, man and um, I just really want to have an idea of what's involved, whether he can bring up um, other matters, which is what he's it tends to do um, when the uh, the forty six A summons when we attended the forty six A summons hearing. Uh, so you're about to go into a pre hearing conference for a fencing no, dispute. Not, yes. Uh, not, then, not, then, it's not imminent, then, but it's then, soon, yeah. Then your your approach has to be that that's not something within that the court has to determine. Well, that's that's how I understand it, but because it's we're dealing with PSIOs, um, that type of scenario. So I just personal want to safety of, intervention order. Thank yes. You. Yep. So I just want to sort of deal with the fencing issue because that's that's what so the that's whole what thing was. You, that's what you tell the registrar at the court that you're here simply for the purpose of giving effect to the fencing summons that's been issued. So that's the only thing that you are going to discuss while you're there. Right, so yeah. he can't he can't bring it. He can any, attempt to bring up, but you don't have like, any responsibility but you don't, to discuss you have it. No obligation to respond mm. to anything. Mm. Sarah, good luck with that. Uh, Charlene and Seaford. Hi, Charlene. Good morning. Hi. Yeah, hi. You're on air. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, my mother passed away four years ago, and her partner at the time is listed as next of kin. Um, he organised all the funeral, etc. Yes. Um, my mother still doesn't have a headstone, and I have contacted the cemetery to try and organise it, but because he is listed, he needs to be the one that organises it. No, he needs um, to be a person who, who agrees for it, to it. There's a concept called the right of burial. Her partner will have the right of burial, and you need the approval of the person with the right of burial to put the headstone up. And if we can't find him? Uh, have you found... Is he still alive? We have no idea. 
uh, the, you can do a probate search if he applied for if there was a probate applied for his state. What you look at is supremecourt.vic.au. On the right hand side of the screen, go to wills and probate, and search the application yep. index and look at that person's name. Charlene, uh, best wishes for that search. Uh, Chris in Croydon. Chris. Hello. Yep. Hello. Hi. Fire away, Chris. Um, yeah, we have uh, several issues with um, Singapore Airlines regarding a flight several months ago. Um, one is that we had um, a five-hour delay leaving the UK, which we understand is subject to um, uh, compensation under EU British law. law. Yes, yep. British law. Yep. Um, the, as a consequence of that, we missed the connection. So, in short... What should have been a 21-hour return journey actually took three days almost. Wow. We were down, put onto um, Qantas because Singapore couldn't um, accommodate us and um, downgraded from business to economy for the final leg of the journey. So that's one issue. Another is that they lost a suitcase. And um, we basically have... Um, emailed them many times. Um, the best response we get is, we'll get back to you within 14 days, and that doesn't happen. So, so has the suitcase to... never been found, has it? No, it hasn't. And do you have insurance for your luggage as part of your travel insurance policy? We do, but the insurers told us that under the Montreal Agreement, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. um, that the airline is responsible for compensation. And um, Additionally, there's... Um, a $250 excess on the suitcase and every item that's claimed for has to have a receipt. Well, how Gosh. many people have receipts for everything mm. in, in their suitcase? Okay, that's, there's three bits to this. You've got a claim for compensation under British law for the, for the delay. When you got to Singapore for the last leg of your journey, you, you the, the problem, I have some sympathy for the airlines, Chris, and what they used to do was fly at about 80% capacity. And if you think if you if a plane's flying at 80% capacity and you take a, a plane out of the system and load everybody on the next planes that are available, you clear the, the backlog in four flights, okay? If you're flying at 95% capacity, which is what they're doing now, it takes you 20 flights to clear the backlog, so I would have thought that when you landed at Singapore, you could have said, no, I'll wait for a business class seat on Singapore Airlines. Uh, and no, sorry, I need to clarify that. They weren't able to put us on the next Singapore, so they... No, 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 I understand it wasn't the next concert. Singapore, but it, it could have it been the next Singapore with a business class seat. Right. As opposed to the next Singapore, right? So we'd have just had to sit it out in Singapore. In a and then you would have presumably had, had a claim for compensation in respect of that. But if I was you, I'd just be desperate to get home. Mm. Uh, well, I will. Yeah, but, but you so might... what can Chris do, in essence, if, if Singapore Airlines not giving any well, joy? I'm, I'm giving lots to work to VCAT at the moment. So you do have a right to make a claim at VCAT. Even uh, with an international airline? Well, because you, she made the contract here. Right. Okay. Right? And, and there's a, a connection. Well, to uh, there's a case recently that talks about, or last year, that talks about whether VCAT has the ability to bring a dispute, to deal with a dispute between residents of other states. And so I've got a uh, an administ guardianship and administration order at the moment where the, one of them lives in, in just over the border in New South Wales and one of them lives in Melbourne. Uh, and we can't bring the matter at VCAT, we've got to take it to the Magistrates' Court, which changes the costs regime mm. and it just goes on and on. Um, I need to look and see, in the light of that case, what happens to Chris's case and whether she's got a VCAT claim. Mm. But a VCAT claim, if she brought a VCAT claim, would be in respect of the downgrade between Melbourne, between Singapore and Melbourne. Not the delay and not the lost luggage. Well, the delay in London is dealt with under UK law. Mm. Uh, then she's got the... Lost luggage. Uh, the lost luggage looks like a damages claim and would normally be brought in the magistrate's court. But I'll... I, can I... I have only got one piece of homework so far, Chris. So, so I'll deal with it then. <laughs> Chris, will leave that as homework. Uh, and unbelievably, we actually have another Chris in Croydon. Hi, Chris. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. 
Um, I've changed I have your got voice, insurance. Chris. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, it's all right. That's don't okay. Worry. Ignore me. <laughs> Everyone else does. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, I got an insurance quote for my Isuzu at Max in September 2022. I accepted the quote, which was the amount that they insured me for. Um, and I and they told me that the money was going to come out of my visa a few days later. Yes. Um, the amount that came out was about forty something dollars less than what um, what they quoted me. Um, just skipping again. Um, on Sunday the fifteenth, a learner driver ran into the side of my car, not doing much damage, but whatever. Anyway, I went in to get my policy number to find out that it wasn't my car that was insured. Yep. Um, it was a Kia Rio that was insured, not my MUX. Oh, yes, much cheaper. Okay. Yep. <laughs> well, I don't know. Chris, but anyway, Chris, but on the, quote, um, the yes. insurance company tells us that they record all calls for quality yes, and training purposes. Ask yes. them for a copy of the call. And if right, you've properly uh, identified the vehicle, yeah. that's the point at which you took out insurance. All right then. Okay. So you're right. the, so it's a question of what vehicle did you yeah. insure? I don't care what their data entry right. operator put in. I'm interested in the deal you struck, and if you quoted the, a um, if you quoted the right model and registration number, the insurance company's got the policy. Chris, good luck with that. Uh, David in Box Hill. Hi, David. Hello to you both. Hello. Yep. Uh, right, I'm just talking about a fine I received in Frankston, in Beach Street, uh, because I had done a U-turn over a single line. Yes. The policeman at the time when he issued the fine said I would not be receiving demerit points, but I've noticed there's two demerit points on it. He said uh, he's not going to take my licence. And uh, so what I did is I, I said to him, I didn't even know that was illegal. It and used to be, the- but it now is, David. Well, I've looked it up and it's not displayed even when I Google it and neither is it displayed on the TAC site. Have a look at uh, legislation.vic.gov.au and told, the road rules. I'm told the Vic Roads website also has it very clearly that you're not allowed to make a U-turn on a road or there is a single continuous line down the centre of the road. And anyway, David, I would imagine ignorance is no excuse. Uh, we're talking about what the penalty like, No, ignorance is not. I have a question for you, though. Um, there are lots of those cat's eyes that you see. Does that render a single line a broken line? Because What's a cat's eye? Uh, those units in the, the, on the road that um, are reflective. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So uh, question is, does that turn a single line into a broken line? It's an interesting point, point that I never want to have to run. <laughs> What's the answer? I don't know. I don't want to have to run that. Gosh, if you don't know, then (laughs) I can understand that no one wants to run that case. David, thank you. Thank you. We will see you again next week. David will be here next week. So if you didn't get on uh, this week, then there is always another opportunity.